Hi Year 11s, welcome back. This is my second revision video based on the AQA sample English language paper one, Jamaica in. And in this video we are going to be having a think about question four, um, the big 20 mark question at the end of section A, the reading section. And we're going to be having a think about how to answer question five, the creative writing question. Um, and when we're looking at the creative writing question, we're going to be thinking specifically about what the difference between a description is and a story and we're also going to be having a look at the mark scheme to see um, what the mark scheme is looking for by way of devices so language and literary devices that we use in our writing um, so that's going to be the specific focus for the creative writing but let's um, start straight away with a question four. So I'm just going to page through my slides from last time until we get to question four. And here it is. So um, just to remind you, um, this is what question four sounds like. Focus this part of your answer on the second part of the source from line 19 to the end. A student, having read this section of the text, said, the writer brings the very different characters to life for the reader. It's as if you are inside the coach with them. And then the question goes on to say, to what extent do you agree? And it gives you some useful bullet points to help you. In your response, you could write about your own impressions of the characters, evaluate how the writer has created these impressions, support your opinions with references to the text. So those are the useful uh, bullet points that they give you. And in this one, it says up here, you could, but actually, if you look at the mark scheme, it's less you could, and it's more you should make sure that you do all of these things. So looking at those bullet points, just to refresh your memories, um, you need to write about your own impressions of the character. And that is whether you agree or disagree with the statement, your own impression. So I can't tell you what to write on this one. You need to come to your own conclusions. And actually, when I'm marking this answer, I really enjoy reading your answers um, and to see like, to what extent you do agree or disagree. The second one is about evaluating um, the impression of the characters. And that's great. But it also says evaluate how the writer has created these impressions. And that means that you need to be looking at methods. Um, so how does a writer use language to create these impressions? How does the writer use structure to create these impressions? How does the writer use narrative perspective? So all the different techniques that the writer uses to create these impressions, as well as your own thoughts and ideas. And then the third one, which weirdly a lot of students sometimes forget to do, you need to support your opinions with references to the text. So you do need to be using quotations to prove your point, especially if it's a point that's based on language okay so if you have a look um, the mnemonic and uh, so the memory device that I always recommend for this one is C's and C's is kind of like an extended version of PEE -E or PEA and it stands for statement evidence inference zoom in and evaluate and after we've uh, had a reread through lines 19 to the end and uh, had a look at some of the highlighting that I've done here, then we will um, we will want to have um, a think about um, how to put it all together. And I've got a model answer for you. OK, so um, what I always do, so you remember that I had kind of had this annotated from earlier um, where it says line 19. So I put a star in there and write, write question four and everything from line 19 down to the end is for question four. And I'll put the keywords from the question up here. So the two parts of the statement, just to remind myself what I'm thinking about. So the first one says, um, does it bring the characters to life? And the second one is, does it feel as if I am in the coach or in the carriage with them? OK, so those are the two questions that it's asking us to think about. So let's reread lines 19 to the end. The few passengers huddled together for warmth. So the first thing that I thought about when I was reading that was, 
I find that quite unconvincing. So I think I might disagree with the statement. I don't think that I would huddle together with a stranger in a coach, even if I was freezing. Um, so I'm not sure that I, if I agree that that brings the characters to life. Yeah, I can imagine them doing it, but I think it's really, really unlikely that they would do that. And the next bit, exclaiming in unison when the coach sank into a heavier rut than usual. So it's this idea that as the, the coach goes along, it might sink down and all the people kind of together go, oh! like and kind of gasp together like when it goes into a hole so i guess that is quite convincing that does seem to bring them to life and you can imagine um sometimes when you're in the car with annoying relatives and your mum goes over a speed bump or something granny in the back kind of like gasps and, and makes a silly noise so maybe that is convincing and the next bit is where we get into more specific characters one old fellow who'd kept up a constant complaint ever since he joined the coach at Truro, rose from his seat in a fury. So now we're, like I said, we're zooming in on this one old fellow, which is a quote. Um, is that a realistic character? Does it bring the character to life? If you're on a train journey or a bus journey, or even a car journey, is there one grumpy old man who is always whinging and moaning. Now you're going to have to decide whether you agree that that is typical of a long journey or whether it's not typical as to whether you think it brings that character to life. And then think about the words. What else does this old man do? He, um, he is fumbling with a window sash. Uh, let the window down with a crash, bring in a shower of rain upon himself and his fellow passengers. So even though the weather is absolutely horrible outside, he lowers the window and lets all the weather and the cold and the damp in. Is that realistic? Is it convincing? Can you imagine sitting on the coach and having to put up with that? Again, picture yourself if you're on a long train journey. Have you known an irritating person to do that, pull the window down even though it's freezing outside? Or maybe it's really cool with the air conditioning inside and someone pulls down the window and kind of stops the air conditioning and it starts getting hot inside. Have you known that to happen? Is that convincing? Does it bring this particular character to life? Does it create a picture? Can you imagine? in the same situation. Um, then the, what does the man do next? He thrust his head out and shouted up to the driver, cursing him in a high, petulant voice for a rogue and a murderer. So this old man starts cursing and swearing out of the window and accusing the coach driver of going too fast. They'd all be dead before they reached Bobman if he persisted in driving at breakneck speed. They had no breath left in their bodies as it was. And he was the one, he for one would never travel by coach again. Um, so again, looking at what's written there, is that convincing? Um, can you hear the man's voice? Can you picture it? Do you notice that the writer there has actually not used direct speech? So there's no quote marks. It's what we call reported speech in that section. So is that effective or do you think it might have been more effective if she'd used direct speech so we could actually imagine the words that he's saying and again that could help you look at the methods that are being used thinking well actually maybe if she'd used direct speech i could have brought his character more to life or because he is moaning on so much a constant complaint would she just not have enough lines to to write down all the whinging and moaning that he he is doing so again you can weigh that up and think about how effective you think it is let's carry on then whether the driver heard him or not was uncertain it seemed more likely that the stream of reproaches was carried away in the wind. For the old fellow, after waiting a moment, put up the window again, having thoroughly chilled the interior of the coach, and settling himself once more in his corner, wrapped his blanket about his knees and muttered in his beard. And again, we've got quite a detailed description of the old man now. So he's cursing and shouting out of the window, but the driver probably didn't hear a word that he said anyway so what was the point of it all apart from getting everyone in the carriage cold and wet again is that something that you could imagine is that something convincing does it bring his character to life can you picture yourself in the coach with him those are the questions you need to ask yourself there's no right or wrong answer 
to this, whether you partially agree or fully agree, you just need to make a decision and explain why you've come to that decision. Okay, let's think about the next character then, and that's the jovial red-faced woman. His nearest neighbour, a jovial red-faced woman in a blue cloak, sighed heavily in sympathy. And with a wink to anyone who might be looking and a jerk of her head towards the old man, she remarked for at least the 20th time that it was the dirtiest night she ever remembered and that she'd known some, that it was proper old weather and no mistaking it for summer this time and burrowing into the depths of a large basket she bought out a great hunk of cake and plunged into it with strong white teeth. So what we've got here is another character, um, as I said the jovial red-faced woman that would be your quotation here um, and she is kind of nodding her head at him probably when he's not looking, uh, probably trying to keep everyone's spirit up. Um, but then she starts talking about the weather and it says it's about the 20th time that she's been talking about the weather. Again, is that typical? If you were on a train journey or a coach journey or a bus journey somewhere, is there always a jolly lady who's talking about the weather and making a comment and trying to chat to everyone and keep everyone's spirits up? Is that something that you find convincing? And if you do find that quite convincing, what is it in the language there? Is it the cheeky little wink and the jerk of her head towards the old man? Um, does that help you to picture it as if you were in the coach with her? Um, or do you find it unconvincing? If you get a jovial red-faced woman, is it the kind of person who's always digging into her bag to find a snack or some food? Again, is that convincing? Um, so you need to decide and then find the language um, or other technique to back up your point. Now, the last one um, about Mary herself is probably like the most interesting one. And we'll, if you remember from question three last time when we looked at structure, a couple of really interesting things going on with Mary and you you can possibly like repeat and build upon some of the points that you made in question three or question four when you think about Mary. So she's the last character who's mentioned. She's the only character who's actually given a name and not just a name, but a surname. And on question three, you might say that was significant because it could indicate that she's going to be a main character in the story, whereas the jovial woman and the grumpy man are not going to be main characters. Um, but Mary is probably the most convincing character here. So she does get brought to life. And partly that is because she sits and does nothing, which is in contrast to the other two characters. Um, but Mary is thinking a lot. She's thinking of lots of different things. Um, and because the writer puts the reader inside her head, it definitely brings the character to life, even though she's not as active as the others. So let's read what it says. Mary Yellen sat in the opposite corner where the trickle of rain oozed through the crack in the roof. Sometimes a cold drip of moisture fell upon her shoulder, which she brushed away with impatient fingers. She sat with her chin cupped in her hand, her eyes fixed on the window, splashed with mud and rain, hoping with a sort of desperate interest that some ray of light would break the heavy blanket of sky and but a momentary trace of that lost blue heaven that had mantled Helford yesterday shine for an instant as a forerunner of fortune. So we get inside her head. So it, she definitely seems to be the most convincing of the three main characters that we've met in that section, I think. You might disagree because she is sitting there quietly and, and her movements and her actions are very small compared to the others. You might find that less convincing. And also thinking about the second one as if we're in the coach with them. She doesn't seem to be paying any attention to the jolly woman and to the grumpy man at all. So maybe that would say, actually, we don't seem to be in the coach with them. We seem to be like Mary, kind of very insular and on our own. So you can get quite a good discussion going there on Mary herself. So you can see in this section what I've highlighted is the few passengers um, which are a little bit vague and they're doing something which seems a bit odd, huddling together for warmth even though they're probably strangers. Um, then we've got the grumpy old man here 
We've got the jolly, the jovial red-faced woman here, and then finally Mary at the end. And we've got this statement that the student has made, she definitely brings characters to life, and it's as if we're in the coach with them, and you need to write a mini essay to say whether you agree or disagree. So I'm going to show you my model paragraph now, and I've based my model paragraph on the grumpy old man, and there's lots and lots of highlighting on this one. So this is uh, what I've put. I somewhat agree with the statement that the writer brings the characters to life. She describes one old fellow who had kept up a constant complaint ever since he joined the coach at Truro, which implies that this passenger has been grumbling about the journey from the moment he set foot on the coach. The adjective constant exemplifying his relentless moaning. When he thrust his head out cursing, the use of reported speech helps me imagine being in the coach having to put up with his foul language and then being thoroughly chilled due to this man's selfish behaviour as if I were in the coach with the others. However, this grumpy old man character is a typical British stereotype rather than a believable character. So on that point, I would have to disagree with the statement. OK, so there's mine. And let's just see what I did in terms of the C's structure. So you can see I've used the different colours to highlight. So up in the yellow, I somewhat agree with the statement that the writer brings characters to life. In each of your C's paragraphs, you can say, I totally agree that she does bring the characters to life when she talks about Mary. I somewhat agree when she talks about the jovial woman. You, you can change it each time, whether you agree or disagree. We've got several bits of evidence, but I start off with quite a long quotation at the beginning and uh, describes one old fellow. And there's the quotation. Then I add a couple more thrusts to set out cursing and thoroughly chilled. I do some inference. So I just kind of put the quotation in context, really. This implies, so I'm just saying what it means, that the passenger has been grumbling about the journey from the moment he set foot on the coach. I'm going to do some methods. So zooming in on the methods, the adjective constant exemplifies his relentless moaning. Another method here, the use of reported speech helps me imagine. Um, and I've zoomed in on the reported speech as well. I've backed up my point even more by putting some more evidence in, thoroughly chilled. Um, and then I've got some more inference. This man's behaviour is clearly selfish. And I've gone back to the statement again, as if I were on the coach with the others. So I keep linking it back to the statement. But here I'm going to do some evaluation. This grumpy old man is a stereotype, not a believable character. So I've evaluated did it there and then gone back to the statement. On that point, I'd have to disagree with the statement. And you can see that I've said I and I've said me. Um, and that's absolutely fine. They want a really personal answer in this one. So to write a good question for, you would probably need to put together maybe three or four C's paragraphs. OK, so if you can imagine, you're going to spend about five minutes on each one. And it has got that those layers in that you need to explore. And in this one, it's perfect for it because you've got the three main characters. So you can talk about the grumpy old man, you can talk about the jovial woman, and then you can talk about Mary. And there's three really meaty C's paragraphs for you. OK, so um, here's your task. Um, and as soon as you've um, finished um, listening to this, you can pause it and have a go at the task. Time yourself for 20 minutes. Have a go at writing two or three more C's paragraphs. And as I just said, you can write about the passengers huddling together. You can write about the cheerful woman and you can write about Mary Yelland. I would definitely do three and I'll probably definitely do two and just see how your time is going, whether you want to write about the passengers huddling together. So when you've had a go at that, come back to this video and we will have a talk about some creative writing. Question five. 
Right, here we are. So section B, writing. Your advice is to spend 45 minutes in this section writing full sentences. You need to plan your answer, leave enough time to check your work at the end. This one says you're going to enter a creative writing competition. Your entry will be judged by people of your own age. That's pretty rare and, and nowadays it's normally like it's going to be published on your school website or it's for the local library. Um, and um, that worries me a little bit because it it means you're thinking, oh, I can use youth slang and sweat. No, no, it needs to be formal English because at the end of the day, like people like me are going to be marking your work, an English teacher. Um, and you've got a choice here, write a description suggested by this picture. There's loads of detail in that picture, it's great. Or write the opening part of a story about a place that's severely affected by the weather. So there's your task. Um, and the first thing I'd like you to have a little think about for me is what is the difference between a description and a story? So just pause the video for about 30 seconds to one minute and see if you can come up with a few differences between a piece of descriptive writing and a story that you're going to make up. OK, so um, actually, Quite honestly, there's not a whole load of difference between a description and a story. If you have a look at description, what you're trying to do in a description is create a certain mood and evoke a certain atmosphere. Description is often about really, really establishing a setting and lots of detail. And description will tend to use quite flowery uh, literary language. A story, on the other hand, might be more focused on plot and action. A story has to have at least two or three characters in it. A story will often have dialogue or speech and a story and story follows a typical structure normally and I've just done um, a screen grab of Freitag's pyramid here. So introduction, exposition, a complication, rising action, the most exciting point, the climax, parapeteal, the turning point in the story, and the falling action, final moment of suspense and a catastrophe or a denouement at the end. So like the revealing of something or the tying up of loose ends, depending on what kind of story it is. Very much a structure that um, literary texts such as in Spectacles or Macbeth follow. So those are the main differences. Description is very much about just creating a sense of place and an atmosphere, whereas a story is actually going to take you on much more of a journey. Now, what I would always suggest is this. Um, if you decide to do the story, try and make it really descriptive. So if you do the story, have a really, really clear sense of place because actually it's kind of mood and atmosphere and the flowery language is going to pick you up lots of points on the mark scheme. Um, whereas if it's just very, very action based, it can be difficult to tick all of the boxes that you need to do. And then conversely, if you decide to do the description, quite often it can be really nice just to add a very gentle, very simple plot into that and maybe a character or a couple of characters in there. Um, so I would try and almost blur the lines between description and story because a description can get a bit boring if it's just this moody atmospheric piece of writing, it can get a bit tedious. Um, whereas a story, as I said, if it doesn't have enough description in it, it can be difficult to achieve the marks that you're capable of achieving. So that's my advice on that one. Um, but I said that we would have a think about devices, about how to use devices. So the mnemonic that um, we're most used to using is a compass. So again, pause it just for 30 seconds to a minute and see how many of those a compass devices you can remember that you might want to use in your creative writing. OK, here they are. I hope that you got them. Alliteration, contrast, onomatopoeia, metaphors, personification or pathetic fallacy, adjectives and adverbs, similes or sibilants and senses. Now, of course, these aren't the only things that you can use in your creative writing. We use dark forest devices. That's the mnemonic we use for our persuasive writing. And some of those can be 
fabulous as well in your creative writing. Um, so maybe rhetorical questions talking directly to the audience, the reader, that can be really fun as well. You probably don't want to be using facts and figures and statistics in a piece of creative writing, however. Um, so you can use more than those, but if you can use a range of those that are up there, then you're well on your way to getting some decent marks. If you're not sure what any of these devices mean, what I'd suggest that you do is pause this video and then just look them up on Google and see if you can find a nice um, English language or English literature site that will just explain those to you and revise. I don't want to waste your time by going over them now. So I've talked about devices and let's have a look at the mark scheme. I've just put the middle of the mark scheme up here for you. So if we have a look at this mark scheme, I've got upper level two, lower level three and upper level three here. Now, if you get right at the top of upper level two, then you should come out with a level four overall in your English. So kind of a bare pass, minimum pass. If you're at the bottom of upper level two, then unfortunately, you'll probably come out with a level three, which is not the kind of pass that you're looking for. So it's a level one qualification, but not a level two that you need to get into six one college and so on. So really, we don't want to be down here. We want to be up here. So let's have a look at these devices and what it says. So for upper level two bare pass or even a fail, conscious use of vocabulary with some use of linguistic devices. And to put this into like words that you might understand, the, the idea of this is your teacher has told you that you need to be using a compass devices. So you are just using those because you've been told to. You're not really thinking to yourself, like, does it work? Is it effective? Um, you're just using them because you've been told to. And I put you an example of what I mean just down here of a typical kind of upper level two comment. There's the picture there. And you might put something like the sea splashed surprisingly like spitting sausages. Um, and you might say there's some great alliteration or sibilants, if you like, here, all these S's which creates the sound of the sea, so that's cool. But, and, and not just that, there's a simile as well, like spitting sausages, but is this cold, salty water, has that got anything to do with sausages spitting and sizzling in a pan? Absolutely nothing. So it's a conscious use of a linguistic device, well, two linguistic devices, in fact, but it's not effective. Um, the simile that's been used does not convey what splashing water is like. Now let's move up and see what it says for lower level three. And in the mark scheme, it says this is clear communication. Here it says vocabulary clearly chosen for effect and appropriate use of linguistic devices. So what this means is you can use those A compass devices appropriately. You might not be winning any prizes for literature. You're not really setting the world alight, but what you've used is appropriate. So here I've put the C swirled and splashed scurrying for the shore. So here we've got that sibilance being used again, swirled and splashed. Um, and that's quite effective for describing the sound just here of the sea splashing. Scurrying for the shore. Well, scurrying is kind of like a, a mouse, which suggests that it's a bit timid and the sea doesn't really look timid. So it's appropriate, but not really, really effective. Um, but the sound effect is. So that's a really good example. It's kind of nice and safe, quite easy language, the vocabulary there, nothing really, really fancy. And it just fits in there nicely. It's just clear, but it's not ringing any bells. And then finally, we've got upper level three. And in terms of translating this into a GCSE grade, if you're into your upper level threes, we're talking about level six, level seven in upper level three. So we're getting into some really good quality passes now, whereas level three here would be like your fours and, and your fives. 
Um, it's up a level three, something like this. The sea swirled, shaking the unsuspecting spectators with a smack. So it says here increasingly sophisticated vocabulary. So it's not like super, super sophisticated. It's not like crafted yet. We're not into our level fours yet, but we've got unsuspecting here and spectators and both of those are quite good words and they almost rhyme together even though they have different meanings um so it's getting a little bit more sophisticated there um it's chosen for effect so it says with a smack so here the sea's not timid and scurrying like it was in this picture it's kind of hitting that smack with the onomatopoeia there it says you have to use a range of successful linguistic devices so you can't just throw that one in and hope to get up a level three you need to be able to sustain that quality of writing throughout your whole piece and that's how you can use vocabulary and devices to move yourself up the mark scheme there. Okay, so I've got two tasks for you here. So the first one is to do a little bit of practice about the devices that we've just been using. Choose three features from this image and choose three A Compass devices which are appropriate and chosen for effect. So you could look at the colourful houses, you could look at the way that the house is kind of almost looking down on the train, you could talk about the train itself, do you think it's speeding past really fast and recklessly or do you think that it is going slowly and carefully, um, what else could you write about, you could imagine that you are a person sitting in this window and see if you could use one of the A compass devices to imagine that or a bird flying by. So have a go at writing three A compass devices to describe the picture and try and make sure that they're appropriate. And then the actual task and this could be a homework task for you as well is to choose one of those tasks either the description of this picture or the beginning of a short story um about um what was it really bad weather something like that and then time yourself for 40 minutes which is how long you should spend on it in the exam because it's out of 40 marks your main success criteria for this one is to try to use at least appropriate vocabulary and devices all the way through and try and sustain that so that's the end of this video i hope that you enjoyed this um exam paper and i hope that you learned something today i'll see you next time Bye bye